Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. If we learn more about today's myeloma research and are willing to participate in clinical studies, we can help advance the collective knowledge to find better therapies for ourselves. And I can't stress enough the importance of our participation. We are one of the important keys in finding a cure. Now, if you'd like to receive a weekly email about the past and upcoming interviews, subscribe to our Inpatient Minute newsletter on the homepage or follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. And we invite you to share these interviews with your myeloma friends. We have a new site called MyelomaCrowd.org. That's the first all-inclusive site for myeloma. And you can take a look at the information on the site if you dig deeper than just the homepage. You can find a myeloma doctor, learn who to follow on social media for myeloma, and learn more about diagnostics as well as many other things. Now today we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Jonathan Licht. Um, Dr. Licht is the... Johanna, Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Hematology and Oncology and Associate Director for Clinical Science of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center of Northwestern University. Dr. Lick received his medical degree from Columbia University and trained in oncology and molecular biology at Dana-Farber and served on the faculty at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in the Department of Medicine and Molecular Biology. Dr. Lick's laboratory studies are on transcriptional repression as a cause of hematological malignancies, including leukemias and myeloma and lymphoma, and is exploring many strategies to reverse these repressions. Dr. Lick was a former Leukemia Society scholar and recipient of a Burroughs Welcome Clinical Scientist Award in Translational Research and is currently the principal investigator of a Leukemia Lymphoma Society Specialized Center of Excellence grant studying mechanisms in hematological malignancy. He's a senior editor of Clinical Cancer Research and serves on the editorial boards of Cancer Research and Oncogene. He's also served as the counselor of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and as a member of the Association of American Physicians. So, Dr. Licht, welcome to the program. Uh, Well, I'm so pleased to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me on to your show. Well, I know that several patients have requested, actually, that I interview you. They are high-risk myeloma patients. I know you've spent quite a bit of time studying and decades of studying high-risk myeloma. So can you first explain in general how you have approached the study of high-risk myeloma? Well, I could could say that uh, how did we even know there's high-risk myeloma there's always been clinical features that might say a patient has a larger body burden of disease at, by the time they come to medical attention. That can be if if someone has a lot of uh, bone disease, if their kidney function is compromised. There's certain blood markers such as the level of immunoglobulin, the beta-2 microglobulin, which can all uh, uh, portend a, a more uh, guarded prognosis. But what happened in the late uh, late 1990s was the discovery of uh, abnormal chromosome sets in the cells of patients with myeloma, meaning these malignant plasma cells or mature B cells that are specialized to make antibodies had within their DNA a certain rearrangement of the chromosomes. And uh, people like Mike Keel, and who I think you're interviewing soon, and uh, Dr. Leif Bergsegel, who you've uh, uh, interviewed before, helped characterize um, these chromosomal rearrangements. And uh, once you had that as, a, as another marker, you could cut across patients who had different levels of, uh, of disease burden, as measured by the, the parameters I said before, and say, well, if, if this person has one type of chromosomal swap or another, does that have a different prognosis? Now, among the, the, the answer was indeed yes, that these chromosomal abnormalities uh, did correlate with prognosis. And the reason for that is that these chromosomal rearrangements lead to the abnormal switching on of 
proteins that have a normal function in the cell to regulate uh, whether or not a cell divides or not, or whether or not a cell should turn on particular genes or they shouldn't. But when these um, genes are rearranged, they're expressed at a very, very high level, and then havoc can be wrecked. And the normal regulation of the cell cycle, the normal um, decision pathways of whether or not a cell should live or die, uh, will be will will be changed, and we think that those uh, so, these uh, so-called cytogenetic abnormalities, where genes are rearranged, are actually what we call driver events, things that actually uh, alter the biology of the plasma cell and contribute to how aggressive a case of multiple myeloma might be. So you know, high risk includes the 414 translocation. Uh, that um, that we study, and another high risk, for example, is the uh, deletion of of chromosome 13, where a whole number of genes that are involved in the normal governance of cell behavior are deleted uh, in the cancer cell, and therefore that cell may have a greater tendency to grow and to cause harm. So um, the first approach was to, to define these groups, and I think. Those groups are continuing to be defined by even more uh, fine genetic analysis, more re recently uh, sequencing every single uh, letter of the genetic code in, in patients' cells uh, with multiple myeloma. That work is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And I know I just read a, the – you have some slides online about the MM set. So can you kind of explain – um, in layman's terms for us all, <laughs> what does MMSET do? What did you find to be the initiating event in the 414 translocation? Maybe we'll start talking about that one first. Sure. So the 414 translocation, what does 414 mean? It means that we have, um, we have 23 uh, uh, chromosomes and we have two copies of each. We have two of chromosomes, you know, uh, two of each chromosomes, one inherited from uh, your, your mother, one from your father. Uh, and 414 means that a portion of chromosome 4 has broken off that chromosome and has appeared on chromosome 14 and vice versa. So there's a switch of genetic material. They're, they're at the wrong place. And the 414 leads to the linkage of the MM set gene to um, sequences of the antibody uh, producing gene, uh, the immunoglobulin gene, and realize that plasma cells, so called B lymphocyte cells, they're specialized to make a lot of immunoglobulin. They make the antibodies that protect us from bacteria. So, what's happened in the 414 is that the um, drive to make a large level of a, of a gene is swapped from the antibody-producing uh, gene to MM set. As a result, the MM set is produced at a very high level of the cell. We think at least 10 times more of it in the, the um, myeloma cell than in a normal cell. Mm. So we think that first the first driver is here is that the MM set gene is put under abnormal regulation. It's switched on to very high levels that are not normally seen in any cell in the body. And is the 414 translocation performing that, or is the MM set the initiating event? I, I guess I get confused about that. Right. The 414 is the initiating event. Okay. What happens is as you're as is, is you might recall, we, when we get a vaccination, we usually get more than one shot, right? You'll get a booster, mm -hmm, you'll get an initial right. vaccination, uh -huh. and then you get a booster shot. And what actually happens when you get booster shots is kind of remarkably the the genome, the actual DNA within a a normal lymphocyte that makes antibodies shifts around and breaks apart and rejoins in an organized way and causes um, the antibody production to become more specialized. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happened in a multiple myeloma patient with 414 is that normal breakage and rejoining of the antibody-producing genes goes awry 
And instead of the antibody gene just rearranging a little bit to become more um, specialized, the antibody gene gets linked accidentally to the MMSET gene. So this is a this is a um, a normal process that it's kind of remarkable. It was unbelievable when first discovered two decades ago. We used yeah. to think that the DNA in your cell just normally just stayed as one big linear piece and never moved, never shuffled. But in immune cells, it normally shuffles around in a controlled way. When it goes wrong, like in the 414, the antibody gene gets linked to MMSET gene. The MMSET gene is normally in vanishingly small quantities in a cell. And when it gets abnormally linked to the antibody gene, you make a lot of it. So it's the 414 that comes first, and that generates the high-level expression of MMSET. Okay, and I, when I was interviewing Dr. Fonseca, I asked if you could reshuffle it back to back to the way it was, and he said, "No, it doesn't really work that way." Yeah, so. I think these these DNA rearrangements are, are first of all they're in every one of the cells. So, mm-hmm. and you know, a, a patient with if you could do it, you'd have to reshuffle it back in billions and billions of cells at 100% efficiency. And Mm -hmm. that's just something we can't do. Yeah. Um, Right. So it is kind of a forever thing. Once it happens, it can't be undone. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that some uh, patients with uh, MGUS, the the um, pre-symptomatic phase of myeloma, where someone may... uh, 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 present to a doctor with, you know, with no symptoms and maybe on a routine blood test is found to have a high blood protein level and a little bit of the so-called M spike, the immunoglobulin or antibody uh, spike in the bloodstream uh, or high quantity, they might be otherwise asymptomatic. And some of these patients have the 414 translocation. So... uh, it seems that it can it can be a very early event in myeloma, and we believe that there are second uh, genetic events, some kind of mutation uh, that collaborates with uh, a mutation, a, a shuffling of genes like the 414, to then uh, create a, a full symptomatic myeloma. And those patients who have the 414 uh, tend to have a uh, a more guarded prognosis. Um, than than other patients, but the MMSET is one of the drivers of the disease. But there must be others as well. And do you just see the same thing where you see an increase of it from MGUS to smoldering, from smoldering to active, and is it consistent across those patient types? Well, if a patient had a, a a 414 translocation as an MGUS, they will almost always keep it as they might move to smoldering and to full symptomatic myeloma. That genetic change is, is it, once it happens, it happens. What may happen is that as the patient uh, moves along and may get more progressive disease, they they may accumulate other mutations. Mm-hmm. The, what mutations those are exactly is under study with a big project from the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation called the COMPASS Project, where patients are getting their cancer uh, genomes assessed at diagnosis uh, upon progression uh, after treatment, and if someone relapses, they would get sampled again. So the mm-hmm. idea is to get snapshots across a patient across time to see what genetic abnormalities might be correlating with the different phases of disease. And I think that data are still those data are still being accumulated. Uh, we do have snapshots on what kinds of mutations are found in patients at diagnosis. There's a limited uh, there's been a few limited studies of uh, checking the cancer genome and the sequence of all these genes at relapse, but I'd say it's too early to make broad conclusions about uh, what uh, what happens during the progression of disease. But in general, most cancers are 
complicated in that they may have a signature uh, genetic event like the 414 or some of the other translocations, but likely their disease um, it has other lesions as well that contribute. Yeah, and I know a lot of study has been done about the detail behind that. We, I interviewed Dr. Lohr about that, and and you know his findings were that myeloma is kind of all over the place in some instances. So, can you describe what MMSET does and how it works, maybe in the most simple terms possible? Sure. Um, so, genes in our cells um, are under uh, very um, controlled regulation. We just will a gene is a piece of DNA that may, that's um, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is, if you would like, the the hard drive of uh, of, of the instructions to make every part of our body, and those. Uh, instructions will get uh, translated uh, into what we call RNA, um, which you might think as maybe being the cable from your hard drive to your computer, okay? And mm-hmm. then there'll be a set of, uh, of interpret, you know, that, that'll then, let's say, give a picture on the screen, let's say. I'm just to use that analogy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your hard drive, you're going to access different information at different time. And these genes... Uh, need to be turned on and off in 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 a precise manner, and it turns out that uh, one of the ways you turn genes on and off is by causing a chemical modification of um, the DNA and the protein immediately surrounding the DNA. There are some DNA is um, is a negatively charged uh, molecule. It's an acid. Acids are always negatively charged, um, and the DNA is wrapped around a positively charged set of proteins, and this helps stabilize the whole pro- structure. And that structure is called chromatin. Um, it, the combination of DNA and these positively charged proteins is called chromatin. So we don't. When we take a, a gene, um, a gene turns on in a cell. It's not turned on from a naked piece of DNA a double helix. It's actually turned on from the DNA wrapped around these histone proteins. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that those histone proteins tend to shut genes off um, when the DNA is tightly wrapped around them. So you actually have to actively change those histone proteins, the chromatin. You have to chemically modify them. You have to move them out of the way and then let the double helix kind of melt in a controlled way, an enzyme comes in that then moves along the DNA and converts it into the RNA, and the RNA is sort of the currency upon which the instructions are delivered to the cytoplasm of the cell to tell you to make a a certain protein, let's say making an antibody protein. So the DNA encodes the antibody protein, the RNA is sort of the messenger in between, and then... uh, protein factors in your cell will make the antibody protein. Mm-hmm. Okay? So what MMSET does, it's one of the one of a set of about 50 or 60 enzymes that actually make a specific chemical modification on those histones and this tends to open up the chromatin help the process of moving the chromatin out of the way and helps let genes get activated. Okay. So it's not it's 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 not a permanent modification. There are other enzymes that can remove this chemical modification so you can oscillate or switch between a gene being on and a gene being off. Okay? So MMS is normally present in very limiting quantities in the cell, and it's only supposed to be at some places and not others, and there's not much of it in the cell. What happens in the 414 is that what we what our research has shown is there's a huge increase in the MMS protein, and it causes a chemical modification of the chromatin of the histones, ev- almost everywhere in the genome. 
whereas normally it only works at a few spots here and there. So it makes a big chemical change in the chromatin. We think this does several things. We think it changes the, the physical state of the chromatin. Uh, we find that it's easier to... The, the chromatin, when we do experiments in the lab, we can actually probe it with little... Um, little molecular scissors, we find it's easier to cut the chromatin. It might be a little more easily damaged, and that might be a bad thing. It might uh, associate with accumulation mutations. We find that genes that are normally shut off in the cell are abnormally turned on because of this chemical modification. And we find, paradoxically, there's some genes that are normally on that are shut off. So, in our studies, when we look at um, cells from a 414 patient where we've artificially removed the MMSET protein, that's something you can do in the laboratory. We can't do it reliably for patients. But if we do it in the laboratory, we, we see uh, thousands of genes change in their levels of expression, and we see that the, the cells uh, tend to slow down and stop growing. So it's impacting the entire environment. In, it impacts the entire genome. Our genome is a billion letters of DNA uh, wrapped up to wrapped up in such a way that there's something on the order of twenty to twenty five thousand genes, and and thousands of these genes may be affected by the high levels of chemical modification of chromatin that occur in response to MMSET. So it's really very, very abnormal. It's, and we're trying to, a lot of times we look at how normal cells develop, normal organisms develop, and this gives us a, a, a paradigm or a model for how genes should work. As I tell my colleagues in the laboratory, MMSET, it's, it's, we can't, we have to break that idea. We don't, this is very abnormal. We have to try to understand this abnormal uh, state of affairs and try to find which genes are being turned on, how they're being turned on, and can those genes be somehow turned back off? Can we reverse the process? And that's one thing that we're very interested in. Can we reverse the chemical modifications that MMSET is doing across the entire uh, genome? That would be amazing if you could figure that out. And I'm glad you're looking at it in a different way. <laughs> so I've heard about HDAC inhibitors. <clears throat> We've talked a little bit about those on the show. Because they have um, they affect histones, from what I understand, do those relate at all to MMSET or no? Well, we do have some evidence that MMSET can bind to uh, some of the histone deacetylases, um, and they may collaborate in some of their aspects of regulating genes. Um, histone deacetylase inhibitors are approved uh, for the treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and they've been used in clinical trials in lymphoma and myeloma. And there seems to be a biological, what we call signal, that some patients have quite a nice response to them, but most patients do not. And we don't yet understand why that is. Um, histone deacetylase inhibitors lead to uh, a, another type of global chromatin change or global change of these histones what I mean by global is there are, you know, if you surveyed across the genome, you'd find histones would be increased in this chemical modification called acetylation all across the genome. If we could lay out the human genome in just a long thread, we'd find all along it there'd be increased acetylation. That actually it's been shown to cr really make the genome much more fragile and more easily mm -hmm. broken. So in a way, like radiation and chemotherapy, 
histone deacetylase inhibitors may work in part by causing damage to the DNA, which some cancer cells have problems repairing, and this can lead to uh, cancer cell death. Mm-hmm. Another way histone deacetylase inhibitors work is by turning on a whole lot of genes that uh, are abnormally silenced in cancers and pushing the cells along a path of programmed obsolescence. Um, A third way histone deacetylase inhibitors work is they actually work not only on histones but on proteins outside of the nucleus of the cell. Remember, the nucleus is the brains of the cell. The cytoplasm is the workstations of the cell. Um, The histone deacetylase inhibitors can lead to increased modification of proteins outside the nucleus that are involved in how we uh, make sure proteins are of high quality in the cell. Cells have a quality control mechanism. You might make a a, a protein that's supposed to be an antibody to fight uh, disease, and it's it's just a little bent out of shape. The Mm -hmm. cell has a quality control mechanism to destroy those proteins. And what it's been shown is that these histone deacetylase inhibitors interfere with that quality control mechanism and can cause enough um, problems, enough faulty proteins to show up in the cell that the cell eventually realizes it and can sort of commit suicide rather than be uh, gooped up with all these faulty proteins. Hmm. So histone deacetylase inhibitors are complicated. We think they have several different effects. Uh, which, which effect is most important for a therapeutic situation may vary in different types of cancer cells. So it sounds like the jury is still out on that one. Well, About- the jury's still out on how they work and how well they work. Um, so, but, but they are very interesting drugs. And I saw that you were doing some research on HMT inhibitors for MMSET. Do you want to talk about what you found to be particularly most effective for the 414 translocation or what you're learning? So, absolutely. This this is a great segue into this. So, as I said, the overexpression of MMSET in a myeloma cell drives a major change in chemical modification of chromatin. In the in the laboratory, we can um, we can um, it, we can we use a technique where we can knock down or almost knock out the MMSET protein, decrease the level of protein to like five percent of the levels normally in a myeloma cell. And if we do that, those chemical modifications in the chromatin go away, and the cells stop growing. As I said, that's not a practical thing to do in patients. What's more practical to do is to find a small chemical that will inhibit the ability of MMSET to chemically modify chromatin. And the chemical modification MMSET does is to put a small carbon linked to three hydrogens called a methyl group onto one particular site of chromatin one particular site of the histone uh, of the histone molecule. So we we and I think others in the field are searching for specific chemical inhibitors of MMSET. We think that if we could inhibit MMSET, we would stop myeloma cell growth. Yeah. And in a modeling experiment, which I think will soon be published, we found that if we depleted the cell of MMSET and gave chemotherapy, actually the chemotherapy that's used in stem cell transplant, melphalan, we could have a major impact on uh, on the longevity of mice injected with a myeloma cell line. So we think that if we could inhibit MMSET activity using a chemical, we might sensitize those cells to chemotherapy effects. So, so the idea now is, can we find that small molecule inhibitor? I'll, I'll break. You may have a follow-up question. I can come back to this. Go ahead. Oh no, no, go ahead. 
Okay, so to look for inhibitors of these proteins, we have to make these proteins in the test tube. In we we make ours in um, in a bacteria. So we take the human MMSET uh, gene and we put it into bacteria and we make large quantities of a portion of the MMSET protein, the portion that actually works as a histone methyltransferase. We have an assay in which we take a small fragment of the histone protein, of the chromatin. We put it into a test tube with MM set, and we actually can monitor the transfer of a carbon atom to this small fragment of chromatin. And we can do this by actually directly measuring how heavy that that little fragment of protein becomes. If you add a methyl group onto a protein fragment, it gets 14 units heavier. And mm -hmm. with my colleague, Dr. Milan Merksich, at uh, Northwestern, uh, we are using a, uh, a, a screening facility which can actually measure that 14-unit shift in methylation. So currently, we're starting a, it's actually starting this week or next, actually probably Monday, a screen for 100,000 compounds against um, this uh, enzymatic activity. Enzymatic means the ability to mediate a chemical reaction. So mm -hmm. we're trying to see if we can find chemicals that will block the ability of MMSET to make that transfer of a carbon group onto histones. We have a few uh, other candidates that we um, that seem to work in the test tube, but haven't yet worked um, in cells. So it's one thing to take a test tube full of MMSET and full of proteins, and it all works together. Some of the chemicals that come out of that screen may be uh, just very toxic to every type of enzyme. We can screen and rule that out. Some of them may be not very soluble in water, so they might be hard to administer to to uh, animals or people. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them may work in the test tube, but have a hard time getting into a living cell. So job one is to set up a assay, a, a test tube-based assay, where we mix the chemical components together, we see the chemical reaction occur, and we look for the inhibition. And that's where we're going now and screening 100,000 more compounds. We suspect that we'll get uh, from 100,000 compounds, we might get several dozen what we call hits, things that work in the test tube. And what we will then do is use a second form of an assay, which we've developed with colleagues at Dana-Farber and the Broad Institute in Boston. Uh, that's Dr. Jay Bradner's lab. And we've agreed that anything we find, we'll test in his uh, assay, which is a different type of assay that uses a uh, uh, sort of a uh, well, it uses a an antibody uh, that actually recognizes that 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 um, that methylation or that chemical group. Um, we'll we'll screen ours against his uh, his assay, and if he finds something, he'll screen against ours. So we have a nice collaboration there. If we validate these chemicals with two different types of um, test tube-based assays, then we will go and put these onto myeloma cells and see if they have biological effects of inhibiting this uh, methylation in the cells. We can monitor that. We have various ways to monitor that. And we can see if that would correlate with any inhibition of cellular growth. This paradigm has worked already for lymphoma, and we're hoping the, the paradigm, meaning finding an inhibitor of an overactive histomethyltransferase, put it on a cell, reverse that chemical modification, and reverse uh, and to stop cellular growth. This is already working in a form of lymphoma, and we're hoping to now make this idea work for myeloma. 
And how long does that screening process take when you go through those various steps? Well, I think we probably could get some. Th- this screening, using Dr. Merchick's um, machinery, we can probably screen, I think, let's see, two, couple, I think 10,000 compounds a day, something like that. So in a week or two, we can get through the 100,000 compounds. That's my understanding. Oh, that's uh, fast. <laughs> once you, pardon me? That's fast. Yeah, it's they have there are these amazing machines where they actually will pipette one thousand five hundred little reactions from one plate to another. It you know, so imagine one th- you know you're sitting with a little pipette in chemistry lab and doing it fifteen hundred times, you'd go insane. So that's why we have robots to do that, uh, and everything is sort of computerized and. Each one of these reactions is then put into a machine to measure the weight one by one. It's all sort of, you know, it, it's sort of an assembly line. So you can you could do thousands of compounds per day. Um, and so in a couple of weeks, we hope we'll have a list of of these um, of these hits. Uh, then we have to do some validation. So actually, it happens. It's interesting technically. We have a hundred thousand compounds sitting in tiny little dishes, and occasionally one of them gets misplaced. It's you know we think it's in um, you know row two, column G of 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 a grid. You go back to that grid, pull out the compound, and test it again. Occasionally, the compounds got misplaced. So you you want to be sure you have the right compound. And then what you might even do is order a fresh batch of the compound from a chemical supply company and to re-verify that your hits, so-called kits, are the real thing. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's a certain amount of quality control that goes in here. You can easily do this badly. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? You're doing testing for accuracy. You have to test for accuracy, right? So, so there's. It, it sounds great. The, the devil is everything is in the details, and so we're we're trying to you know dot our eyes and so forth, so forth to be sure that anything that comes out of this screen is is real. I mean, we 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 have money from NIH to do this. We have money from you know the MMRF and the Leukemia Society, and and we know how hard. The community works to try to support scientists, and we we are taking our data integrity very seriously. And when I was talking with the, Dr. Bergsogel, he was mentioning he went into some discussion about MYC, M-Y-C. and I know MYC and MEC can get confusing because I'm going to ask you about both. But um, you had done some research about MM set and MYC. So I don't want to interrupt if you had other things to talk about with the validation process, but I'm curious about that as well. Absolutely. Um, I'll just say one last thing about the validation, and then I'll move on to that. So if we get a chemical that works in these test tube assays and then works in cells, the next thing to do would be to see if it can be safely given to an experimental animal. And we would do this with graphs of the myeloma cells into a a special animal, and we can monitor those the growth of these tumor cells in animals, and we would give the animals uh, these 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 drugs, and we could monitor if these would limit or reverse the growth of the myeloma cells. If that all goes well, then you start to get into the the realm of trying to develop a clinical product, and at that point, we would probably if if we were Successful at that point, we'd have to try to license this work with a, a larger corporation because the scale of money you need to take something from your own laboratory and academic institution to try to get all the data together to uh, to, to to try a clinical trial in patient is is many is is many tens of times tens or hundreds of times more money, and there we need industrial partners. Mm-hmm. So that's how, if it all worked well, that's what we'd hope. Now, turning to MYC, uh, MYC is a essential gene. It's it's a gene that's found in lower organisms like the fruit fly. It's found in people. 
current ideas are that MIC is sort of like the volume control on your on your you know amplifier. And if any of you remember the movie This Is Spinal Tap, where the where the guitar amplifier went to 11 instead of 10, they were the band was so loud. When MIC gets um, reshuffled in many diseases, it's like turning the volume control to 11. A whole lot of genes get turned on in a very abnormal way, and cell growth is is really pushed very fast. We have some cell lines in our in our lab which have MIC rearrangements that seem to divide two or three times a day, like twice as fast as most typical cells. Hmm. So MIC is, it turns out, as the more myeloma, there's actually a fundamental, let me back up, there's a fundamental paradox about myeloma. The normal specialized lymphocyte that makes antibodies called the plasma cell has a very low level of MYC. In fact, MYC levels drop as as you go from a more immature lymphocyte to a fully mature plasma cell. MYC levels drop. But the myeloma patient has the paradox that they have a, this very specialized cell that makes lots of antibodies, and the antibodies can cause many of the symptoms of myeloma the abnormal mm-hmm. levels of antibodies in the bloodstream. But at the same time, that plasma cell has high levels of MYC and is always dividing. So there seems this, this is really the, a fundamental paradox and a problem we have to solve. Mm-hmm. So it, what we found was that MM set, uh, high levels of MM set, so, uh, increased levels of MYC in the myeloma cell. And if we deplete MM set from the myeloma cells, MYC levels drop. Um, This happened in a complicated way. It's not that MM set actually turns the MYC gene on or off directly. It actually regulates the levels of the MYC protein through an intermediary, a very small piece of RNA that is um, suppressed by MYC, by MM set. MM set suppresses a small piece of RNA. That small piece of RNA called a microRNA normally limits uh, MYC levels in the cell. Hmm. And it it does this by destroying the MYC RNA, basically sequestering and destroying it. So let me come back, let me say that again. MYC is normally under tight control, including control by small RNAs called microRNAs that bind to the MYC RNA and destroy it. When MM set levels are very high, at least one of those microRNAs go down, and then MYC levels go up. Okay. That's a little complicated, I understand. But the major point is that MM set, like many other of the genetic abnormalities in myeloma, tends to increase MYC levels. Okay. And MYC, therefore, is a therapeutic target of myeloma as well. And I know I still have so many questions I want to ask, and um, I don't want to inhibit the other questions that I have from getting asked that people have emailed me or people might have online. So one final question about MM set. Is there anything that myeloma can discover from MM set in other cancers, like ALL or prostate cancer or leukemias or lymphomas? What we discovered this past year is the MMSEP protein is mutated in a very specific region and it hyperactivates the protein in acute lymphocytic leukemia of children. And it seems to be doing the same thing in that disease, very similar things that it's doing in myeloma. But in this case, the gene has not gotten scrambled and turned on to a high level. It's just that the gene is, um, the protein is more active, and it's doing that chemical modification at a very high rate. Mm. This also happens in certain cases of mantle cell lymphoma. So what we're learning about uh, MM set in myeloma may translate into other types of blood cancers. 
Lastly, MMSET levels have been found to be very high in particularly advanced prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And we think that, again, it may be doing something similar in perhaps turning on MYC and stimulating cell growth. So we think if we had an inhibitor of MMSET, it might be useful for several different diseases. And you're just at the point now where you're screening for those and trying to find one that's going to be the most effective. So that's correct. It still sounds early. Well, I wanted you to also cover, I know you had done some other research also in MEC in other translocations like 1416 and maybe in 1420. And so I wanted to, or the mass translocations. And so while we have you, I'd like to ask about those as well. Well, the um, the idea of uh, MIC and MEC in myeloma, there was one thing we actually um, thought about here is that um, MEC is a um, is a different different beast from we're talking about an MM set. Now, MEC yeah. is a protein that's involved in transmitting a growth signal from the surface of a cell into the interior and eventually into the nucleus to tell cells to go on and, and off. So um, the, um, the, um, the, this kind of growth of factor rearrangement actually even occurs in the 414 uh, translocation because in many of those patients they have a overexpression of the fibroblast growth factor receptor. So Part of the problem in the 414 might be that this receptor that signals into the interior of the cell is hyperactivated and overactive. And MEC is a, um, is a protein in a sort of chain reaction, starting with, imagine a growth factor binds to a receptor on the cell surface. This sets off chemical reactions that go in a chain from, from protein to protein each protein being chemically modified, that protein gets activated, modifies the next protein, and it amplifies a signal into the cell. So MEC is one focal point in this signaling cascade. And there's evidence that if you gave inhibitors to MEC, you could actually inhibit um, these chemical signals and inhibit myeloma cell growth. So that's one current um, current uh, type of research going on in, in myeloma. And is that just for the MAF or is that for MMSET too? Or is that for everybody? This would be, there's been particular particular um, um, interplay, I think, with, um, and uh, there's been some interplay with uh, MMSET and, and MEC. Um, so there is some some idea that the MMSET tumors might be particularly dependent on MEC, but I don't think that's been um, I don't think that's been um, completely clarified. So I would say that this type of inhibition of signaling uh, approach is one that should be continued to be um, continue to be uh, explored in many forms of myeloma. Along that line, there are mutations in these signaling pathways, and one uh, that's been of interest has been in a protein called BRAF, B-R-A-F. This is mutated in about 5% of patients with myeloma. This causes hyperactivation of RAF, and you could possibly treat those, uh, those patients with RAF inhibitors, chemicals against RAF, or possibly MEK inhibitors. And I believe clinical trials are underway to try this. Uh, but it's only the drug would only be thought to work in this, pa in this small set of patients with these activating mutations in the signaling pathway. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 this, that in, in, in summary, what I'd say is that in addition to changing gene expression programs through these chemical modifications of chromatin, changing signaling pathways from the surface of the cell, where a cell gets a signal to grow or not to grow, uh, through chemicals that inhibit the chemical reactions that convey those signals, is another very viable 
potential therapeutic approach for myeloma. And when you look at the MAF translocations, is there an approach that you you think works better than others? I I myself have not I've I I've not done much uh, I've not done anything really on MAF myself, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that the MAF it, it, um, what I think is going to happen in the case of the MAF is it's going to turn on um, certain uh, certain pathways and. Um, you know what what we actually find is that with the with the m m set rearrangement and the math rearrangement, there can be you know it could be that it turns on certain gene pathways that then makes you know makes the s cells more susceptible um more susceptible to uh inhibition by mech so I think what you, when you have a math uh, rearrangement, you can actually potentially um, change the how the cell depends on other pathways, and as such, you might uh, sensitize the cell to inhibitors uh, of signaling such as MEK. So I think I actually think more work needs to be done on math to understand the identity of all these other pathways that might complement the MAF rearrangement to, you know, support the growth of the, of the myeloma cell. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I know there's been some discussion, and recently there was a video on managing myeloma where several of the doctors got together to talk about the updates on cure versus control. So, when you look at those who are being potentially cured, I want to say, um, are those patients with no translocations at all, or are those? Do you do you have any idea? Well, I think that I think that uh, I think that that's still a little early to understand that. I think we only now have the technology to understand the patient who has been treated and has had no relapse for 10 or 15 years. You know, there's ever more of those patients. Mm -hmm. I think that some of this will have to do with what set of chromosomes they had. You know, not every 414 patient will do poorly. We now have, we know that bortezomib works well as an initial therapy for 414 patients. Mm -hmm. Um uh, you know, and so if we get better drugs, and we have better drugs all the time with you know pomalidolide, you know, with all the imids coming out, um, and and getting ever better, and and all of the you know the next versions of bortezomib coming out, so we're getting better drugs all the time, and eventually we we'd like to have patient with every you know chromosomal abnormality, every mutation, have an equally good prognosis. We're we're hoping for that time. But we do find that there are some patients who have extraordinary responses to drugs, and very often these so-called um, single patient experiments are very informative. It's been found if you sequence the, the genome of the cancer cell of the patient who has an extraordinary response, you find that they had an extraordinary mutation, and it helps explain the response. I think the things like the COMPASS trial where we have a snapshot of the genome of patients before therapy and following them all the way for years and years, we may be able to backtrack and say, here are the people who have lived 20 years or never had their myeloma come back. What was particularly special about the set of genes that they had in that cancer cell to start? Is it due to a special set of cancer genes? I suspect it will be, but I don't know what that set will be yet. I do think having um, a, um, not having chromosome 13 deletion, not having some of the, you know, the, the worst translocations, it'll be amongst those patients, I think. But there may be other uh, genetic uh, uh, mutations that, they specifically might have or not have that might help um, correlate with how well they did. All right. And I have two more questions for you, and then I'm going to open it up for callers. The first is when you're talking about the COMPASS study that the MMRF is putting together, 
I think that's an easy, easy study for patients to participate in. And I think we need more of that. So when you look at disease registries like cell genes or the MMRF compass study, um, they're existing to find patterns big enough to find populations so you can start seeing these patterns. But are there other ways that that data can, I don't know how the data is um, shared, but could that be provided to lots of different providers so everyone can kind of pitch in with their their thinking? Or is that how it's done currently? I think um, there is, there are, there needs to be some safeguards on, um, on genetic data uh, in the sense that um, when you sequence these cancer, um, the genomes of the cancer cell, you're also sequencing the, the, the DNA of the normal part of the patient. And it's very hard to let out all this data without um, discerning identities. It turns out there's enough genetic data deposited in um, the websites like 23andMe, which is shut down now, but others like... So it's very easy to link um, people to identify who that person was. So we would release this data if it was anonymous, but mm. it's hard to keep raw genetic data from these studies anonymous because there are computational ways to figure out who that pe person was. It's mm. really quite remarkable. So I think these types of genetic studies, if you simply say we had uh, – uh, patients 1 through 10 had a mutation in math, and patients 2 through 20 had MM set, and here's their prognosis. That's the kind of stuff you can release. If you want to get all of the raw data released, that takes uh, privacy uh, and collaboration agreements and, and other safeguards. Uh, but a lot of the, um, a lot of the more um, somewhat digested data can be shared uh, and reanalyzed, and and this happens. I, I don't think the Compass data is it's early days for that, but there are other databases where there are genetic information you know, databases where you could go and see, you know, does the RAF mutation in colon cancer do those patients have a bad or good prognosis? You, you can do some explorations of these types of data, and so I think this will be shared. And I do encourage your listeners to participate in, in clinical trials that do include uh, genetic information. I assure you that this has been very, very heavily thought through, and that genetic information will be safeguarded and will be kept uh, private and would only be used in such a way that, it, that only good would, would come from it. Um, so, uh, well, but I think it's, it's going to go on. Mm -hmm. I, I highly encourage it because um, as a patient, this is what I want to see. I want to see all patients with my genetic mutation, and then I want to see comparative work to say what therapy did they receive and what's the best outcome for that mutation type. And, and that doesn't exist for me as a patient today. And when I'm coming in newly diagnosed and I have to make a quick decision about what kind of therapy I'm going to receive, that's something I want to know. Uh, yeah, I understand, and I think I think we should. I, and I think that you know, uh, you know what they say: information wants to be free. And I think uh, we as physicians want to do that, and we, but we want to be sure we do it in 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 a very collaborative way, in a way that the information. Uh, can be properly interpreted. You know, a little bit of Google searching and you can get all kinds of the wrong ideas about things. So I, I agree with you. All right. Well, I think um, what you're doing is amazing and wonderful, and we hope you keep going. So I'd like to open it up for caller questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Lick, please call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And we'll start with um, one, a first caller, 557 6827. Hi, Dr. Okay. Lick. Hi, Hello, Dr. how are you? Hi. Good, good, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing uh, your work. And uh, I wanted to ask you, what are your suggestions for patients with the addition of chromosome 1? 
Could, could you repeat the question again? Yes. Uh, what are, what what are your suggestions for patients with the addition of chromosome one? I guess as a high well, risk marker, maybe. Right. So I I think that you know the the issue here in these types of high risk things is that we currently are we're currently uh, annotating those. Uh, we're, 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 when I have a, if I had a patient in our clinics here, um, patients and physicians want to know what the prognosis may be. And these types of markers can be an aid. What they might militate towards in some cases is prop, most patients now are starting on multi-agent therapy that will include an image, that include a proteasome inhibitor, and I think when you have these markers of a more guarded prognosis, uh, you as the physician and patient might opt for uh, a stem cell transplant a little sooner. You might have an guarded level of monitoring to try to be sure therapy is working. We're always doing that anyway, but it's a matter of heightening consciousness. You know, If it was a matter of a... Um, after uh, giving initial induction therapy, there's there's some uh, debate in the field on how much maintenance therapy there should be after you've given got an initial excellent response. Should you continue uh, IMIDs indefinitely? How often? I would say that the patients with the higher risk would be the patients who might get more maintenance, who might get transplantation sooner rather than later, who are going to be watched very carefully. Uh, but right now, it's not been the, uh, the practice at our institution, nor my was speaking to people in the field, to change the initial therapy a great deal. Uh, that, that, of course, you know, that might, you know, there might be some who disagree with that. But I think it's a matter of um, of just having a heightened state of vigilance, and uh, you know, and again, that collaboration between physician and patient. Okay. Thank. Thank. Thank you. Thanks for your recommendations. I was here making some notes, but thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Our next caller is at 9836757. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, Dr. Lick. Thank you so very much for being able to understand this very complex disease on our behalf. Um, I'm a smolderer. My name is Dana, and I have a question for, um, in, in general for smoldering patients. Uh, how important is it for smoldering patients to know their fish and or gene expression profile? Um, do we need that level of testing? Will it determine and help us understand our risk progression? Or is it more significant and helpful for just treatment plans? Well, currently, um, the gene expression profiling is is not not in our practice at Northwestern uh, and, and in many other places, it's not part of of standard care. It has been part of the uh, of the Arkansas group. It's part of their uh, their thing, and um, and I think that it may be at one time. Um, so I'd say that if, if we were to do it at our place, we consider that a, a research study and something to still understand. One thing about these gene expression profiles is that the so-called, the devices or so-called platforms upon which they're being done are changing as well. Now we have other technologies to look at the gene expression profile that are even more uh, sensitive than the gene chips used in the past. So I think that's a bit of a moving target. In terms of looking at fish profiles and chromosomal rearrangements, I'd say for someone uh, smoldering, um, you know, I I think it would uh, it would be sort of a bit of a peek at the future, and uh, but I suspect that additionally that if many times if a patient goes from a smoldering state and then uh, unfortunately you know progresses, uh, and many pe- many physicians would consider getting those chromosomes again and see what was different, mm-hmm. and that might actually be very very important as well in terms of, of looking at that. So my general feeling about these chromosomal markers is that they are um, 
they're an adjunct to good clinical judgment by your physician. You don't you don't want to start therapy too soon on someone who really you know has minimal M spike and you know no bony lesions and everything's you know it's just kind of smoldering. Uh-huh. Sounds sounds good. So sometimes you have to do a a watchful um, you know watchful waiting and collaboration with, with between the patient primarily and the physician and be sure we use good judgment when to move forward. Thank so you, Dr. I'm, You're mm-hmm. very welcome. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a, a follow-up question to that. What what testing, what diagnostic testing would be then the most critical for someone with smoldering to have and to make certain that we are indeed getting on either a regular basis, whether it's quarterly semi-annually, annually, to make certain that we truly are being followed in the best way. Right. I think, you know, initially my approach would be would be to sort of get a sense of the pace of the patient themselves, you know. So so the, the way I would probably start is probably with some kind of quarterly, uh, you know, measurement of the immunoglobulin spike, the beta-2 microglobulin, being sure the creatinine is fine, listen to the patient uh, very carefully, be sure that they're, you know, how they're feeling symptomatically. And then I think once you get a sense of, uh, get a sense of how the patient, you know, is, pro- is progressing or not progressing, you might space that out a little bit, a bit longer. You know, a uh, initial, many, many physicians might do uh, cytogenetics initially, but that's only done sort of at diagnosis, you, and that's done by the bone marrow biopsy. So mm-hmm. you don't do those over and over again. So basically we have to monitor the blood counts, make sure that all the the, the red cells, the white blood cells, the normal white blood cells, the, the granulocytes, as it were, that fight infections, the platelets, they're all fine. Uh, what what do the blood chemistries look like? Um, how how large is the is the M spike, the abnormal antibody spike, and and get a sense of the get a, get a sense of the um, of the of the of the of the of the pace. Um, so that's the way I would, I would approach it. And the free light chain ratios for smolderers, how important are they? If we have abnormal ratios, what does that signify to us? Does that mean that we have a disease that's more likely to progress? Is it more, um, you know, unstable? Um, that one is a little bit outside of, of my expertise. I'm going to be honest about that. So mm-hmm. that's one that I have not done much work on study myself. Um, so I would have to I would have to defer uh, to that. Actually, there there are some good sites for that for patients. The International Myeloma Foundation mm-hmm. uh, has things about that as well. But I, I I'm going to have to defer on that one. I apologize. No, that's fine. Thank you so very much for your time. Much appreciated. You're very welcome. Okay, and thanks, Dana, for your question. Okay, I have two more quick questions, and um, I need to ask them because people requested it. So Carol said, do do you think the IMF consensus group will or should redefine active myeloma to include high-risk smolders with a 17 deletion? Um, And so she says, it matters because clinical trial availability is affected by the definition as well as early access to standard myeloma treatment. She says she participated in the NIH CRD trial, and she's cur- currently MRD negative and on maintenance Revlimid. She says, I'm, I'm in no hurry to start another regimen, but would like to know it's there if needed. Do you have an opinion on that? Well, I, I'm, I'm personally... Um, I know I know there's been a number of studies of treating, you know, smoldering myeloma now with with IMIDs and I think it remains a little bit controversial. I mean, I think, you know, the thing about that is I think um I think these are good questions to a- ask and I think that these studies should go forward and we need to continue to follow how these patients you know, with with smoldering myeloma, if we intervene early, will we make a real long term difference? Um, you know, we it, it should be noted that maintenance um, uh, images are not without side effects as well. So right. I think we have to we have to we have to carefully balance that. So um, 
I I think that um, I'd have to defer to my, my colleagues uh, who are much more involved in the clinical trials, my friends like uh, Paul Richardson at Dana Farber, Ken Anderson, um, Nikhil Munshi, and you know people like that. So I would I really would defer to them. Okay. And Larry's last question. He says I wrote a post on the myeloma beacon about high risk patients that can go on to clinical trials until they've relapsed. So it's kind of the in-between stage. So he asks, isn't this counterproductive for the high-risk patient who may need to be doing some proactive therapy? And I don't know what you found for 414 patients or or others with those types of situations. So the issue here is the patient is uh, is high risk but has very good uh, response, has had minimal residual disease, but right. the, the the patient the, the the caller or the the emailer would like mm-hmm. to know shouldn't I do more therapy now is that that's a question yeah or could I possibly because most clinical trials you can't join unless you have active disease so is there anything that might be less have less impact on like an imid or a proteasome inhibitor and maybe like a monoclonal antibody that might be or a vaccine that might kick you into a longer term remission, especially if, if you have a higher risk feature? I think that's the question. Right. So so you've, you've had a high risk disease. You've gotten very intensive therapy. You've gotten, you know, you know, uh, you know, dexamethasone, you've gotten bortezomib, you've gotten image, you've got a great, very good response, uh, but you're still in high risk. And you're, you really want to do something before relapsing. I think that would be an excellent place for something like a vaccine trial to come in. Because at that time period, you don't want to add too much more toxicity, but right. you might want to try something that might be efficacious. And I think that would be a reasonable time to try something like a vaccine trial. Um, I think that um, adding a potentially toxic, you know, first in human drug in someone who's in a, you know, relatively asymptomatic and has minimal disease, that has problems with, you know, potential safety issues. And additionally, realize the um, that we need to have a, an ability to objectively, you know, uh, understand disease response. Now, um, what I'm saying is if you have a new drug, it's the fifth generation bortezomib, and you want to know, does it work at all? One of the ways that drug will get eventually approved is to show that it works in someone who's relapsed from bortezomib or mm-hmm. has been refractory to bortezomib. So you really want to um, – there's a, there's sort of a, a clinical strategy. There's a bit of – for the pharmaceutical industry is a bit of a business strategy of where will they take this new uh, resource, which is limiting. You know, these drugs are expensive to manufacture. They want to be sure that they're going to apply it to patients who really need it and uh, in a safe way and a way where we can make an actual judgment about whether or not it works taking a very new agent and giving it to a patient who has very little disease is not um, a reliable way to actually show that the drug works. So that's where we need your collaboration and understanding that these are experiments that you as the patient, we have your benefit number one in mind. Um, And you know, clinical trials are, we encourage them, we think they, they give the paradigm for the best care, but it may not be always for everyone, and we understand that. But we we like to collaborate with you and take a leap into the unknown together to try to make this uh, disease, you know, get it to a very curable state. Well, thank you so much for your work. Um, Thank you for your dedication to myeloma and especially for high-risk myeloma, for those of us who share those features. Um, You've been very, very enlightening today, and we've taken lots of your time, but we're so grateful you made the time for us. And it's really comforting to know that you are looking out for us, and we're very just grateful for your really amazing work. Well, thank you for this opportunity, and I'm 
delighted to be introduced to your community and to our community. I'm looking forward to working with you together to try to uh, eliminate this disease. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in My Loma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn how we as patients can help drive to a cure for myeloma by joining clinical trials. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Over and by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.